is taking something you're doing today manually and making it happen in a more automated way. I would, I would add also that the detail of creating systems and processes is like the foundation of what needs to be in place in order to create powerful automation. And so with the new technology that's available, with how everything is becoming more available on the cloud, it's important to have these processes and systems created because that's going to be what you're going to be using as the backbone to be able to repeat over and over and over a, a, whatever it is that you got going on. <laughs> I, think, I think it's funny how you two kind of think of it from like this technical standpoint, and I think of it as more of like a marketing standpoint. And Jimmy and I actually normally disagree on this. Or we look at it from different angles, not, not really disagree. But I look at it as client touches and the number of times we can touch a client. And it is all the other you know mechanical stuff, so moving things from one spot to the next and, all, and not having to manually do it. But, to me, it's increasing those touches with clients and so that they're, it increases their client satisfaction and you, you, it's just better for your business in general. So I think it's interesting how you all look at it from that, that perspective. I look at it from a completely different perspective. I look at it as a tool for how the client receives information. And it's all about the client, and it's all about customer service, and it's coming, and on all of the way we talk about, you know, to build referral businesses. Give me an example of how you use automation in your business? A basic softball question, but we're going somewhere here. And, I, and the people that listen to the show, they, they probably know some of the stuff that they've heard, heard me talk about it, but um, as simple as with Infusionsoft, what you can do is in the first week, I mean, I, let, me, let me ask this question to the crowd. How many people talk to their clients when they first sign up with one time in the first week? Most of you should raise your hands. Okay, what about five times? How many, how many touch your clients in some way five times? That's hardly anybody. J, you know, Jay Ruane, yeah, ob obviously, because you, you're a, also an automation genius as well. But like with Infusionsoft and, and Lead Docket and other tools, I can touch my clients 15 times in the first week with emails, letters, text messages, things like that. We use Filevine now, which has an awesome text messaging feature. That is actually not automated, but um, my guess is at some point it might. But with Lead Docket, it is automated, so they get automatic text messages from us when they sign up. Um, Infusionsoft, you get a series of videos from us in the first seven days, so you get, a, a, you get eight emails, seven of those are the videos. And so, and that doesn't include the letters that they get. So. These are all touches that they get from us that I can't do manually. If you think about all that, if I had to actually physically send each one of those emails with a video link, it'd be insane. And so it, it increases those touches exponentially. When you started your practice, what was the first piece of automation you touched? It was Clio and it was DocGen, and I don't consider that automation, but it's, I mean, that was like probably my first, I think probably automation was, I, I thought the doc gen and Clio was amazing and I, now I know much better, but uh, it's, it's. You, but it you know, cool. Eric, in, in addition to you uh, developing, you know, this product uh, for intake and conversion, you run a law firm and it's a sophisticated law firm. It's very lit litigation oriented. The question that I have for you is what was the first steps you took when you and Dino wanted to start to what we call automate the practice? Right. So what I did is I actually sat down with, uh, we, we work in paralegal attorney teams, and I just went and sat down with each team, and just watched their workflow, just saw what they were doing. And you know, I was just telling them a few minutes ago, uh, one of the first things I saw, and this is not related to automation, was that we had two copiers. So they would get up from their desk all day and run to the copier and just wasted a bunch of time. So it was an easy thing, just put our a printer on everybody's desk and just speed up the process so they're not getting up and talking all day. Uh, and then the next thing we did is I, I realized that the document creation was a huge problem that every paralegal attorney team was using different documents, right? They would send a welcome letter that had different information than the next guy. Uh, everyone was doing demands differently. So we just took one document at a time based on the number of times we sent that document in the course of a year and just did one at a time until we, it, it took like a year and a half to get through every document that we do and made all of those into our case management system to automate them. Oh. Uh, I actually don't have a practice, and I'm not an attorney, but I've worked with enough attorneys and small businesses to know that kind of the first area that you should focus on getting a system and process going on is how uh, new leads or new prospects come into the business and how they're going to be handled. Uh, because if that's not fixed or doesn't have a solid, reliable way of doing that, then it doesn't matter how efficient you are on the back end if you can't reliably produce consistent business. And so that's a common theme that I've noticed 
and implementing automation in different small businesses for the past 11 years that that's hands down like the number one thing. So Harley, it's funny, you got me thinking about my first piece of automation and then something Eric said and then something Kelsey said reminded me of some, something really great. So my first piece of automation was different. I, I remembered, and this is all goes down to making sure you have the, the entire processes mapped out. I had basically all, every letter that I used from point, from A to Z in a case packet. And in a, every, every time we had to send off a letter, we would go to the case packet and we would send out that letter. It was like in a Word document. But the, the automation element of it, of it was uh, control, find, re replace. So we would yeah. go and we would have you know, this case packet. We replace the client's name, the case number, if there's a case number, and all that. So like, that was really my first piece of automation. And it was sim similar. We had all the documents we had to replace. And so yeah, that was, that was my first one. So. You know, I'm, I'm really awestruck when I look at the uh, website, the Max Law website, and, and John Fisher's uh, experience website and the questions and the abundance of the questions of revolve around technology and quite frankly automation and that's my view of it I, I'm a member of that group because I'm learning from you all young lawyers embracing the internet wasn't invented when I started it. <laughs> I think it's interesting you saying you're learning from us when you're a no, marketing I'm legend. From you. I mean, this guy, if you don't know Harlan, he's, he's an incredible marketing mind in the legal industry. Thank you. But I'm learning from you because I'm learning new techniques. I'm learning how you consume knowledge, information. But the thing I'm learning the most is, is how you're disseminating information. And that, that's why I'm so fascinated with the word automation. I use it as a, a, another word. But uh, let, me, let me throw out to Kelsey. You know, how do you determine, Kelsey? And, and, you're a, and you're a genius when it comes to this. There's few people in this country that know Infusion Software, which is a complicated piece of software to put together, not necessarily to use, but you're a genius when it comes to managing it and understanding it and, and, and utilizing it and, and making it prof you, the use of it profitable. So uh, how do you determine what kind of software to use you know, when you want to be an automated focused practice? I mean, you know, there's, there's 20 vendors in a, in, in, in a meeting, and they all say something different. How do, how do you go about buying a piece of software? How do you go about positioning yourself? What do you need to know? Well, uh, that's a, in a, in a very interesting question. And there's a lot of factors that go into selecting software. Um, first and foremost is I have uh, to like, you have to be able to understand budget. So some people are going to be able to spend a lot of money and buy something like Salesforce, which is insanely expensive and some people don't have any money to spend towards this type of product so evaluating a budget for where you are is the the first step um, the second thing that I look for is expandability and what that means is that if, if you're going to if you have to use this for a while you are you going to be bottlenecked or stuck in a certain situation so with the way that the internet has gone and new integrations and everybody has APIs is the ability to either bolt stuff onto your existing solution or expand functionality beyond what it already comes with. So you want to be able to have the flexibility uh, with whatever software to tech stack that you're building uh, to be able to do that. Because nobody wants to be in a situation where you have this application that costs thousands of dollars a year that you can't, you have to go and type a name, or you're double doing double, triple data entry. It's like the worst thing in the world. I mean, I wouldn't even, if that's something I had to do, I would probably be homeless right now. So it's interesting. So about I don't know four or five years ago, I had considered having like Bill Umansky's done having a software built, and so I listed every single thing I wanted on it, um, and I, I met with a software developer, and I was about a third of the way, of the way through the list, and he says, "Okay, I'm going to stop you." He said. I don't know how much longer your list is, but it's about a quarter of a million dollars for just what you want right now. So like, and he says, should we continue the conversation? I said, no, we should probably just move on. Um, so I start with li the list of items, and but the problem is, and I'm you know, sorry, you know, Filevine and Lawmatix and everyone else, I, but there's not a product that exists on the market that has everything I want. It just doesn't. I think that's why integrations are so important. I think uh, having Filevine integrations with other products and, and Lead Doc is the same thing, and that's why Zapier is so amazing. I think, and think about just 10 years ago, I worked for a, a firm that had, it was software based, right? It wasn't, it wasn't cloud based. You can't integrate that crap. I mean, that, luckily with the internet, we can integrate all these things and it's great. And, 
all these different systems work together. But I, I think that where, where you should start is really list the things you need, find the best product for that, and if it fits within your budget, go with it, and then try to work with integrations. So how do you ask the questions in shopping for a software company? Eric? How do you ask the questions? Um, you know, I think you really have to understand what it is that you need, but also be willing to, I, I guess, listen and take the advice of what they've come across from their experiences. Um, I, I think it really just comes down to every business is different, right? There's businesses that they're focused on volume, and it takes different software to do that than, than a business that's focused on uh, a smaller number of clients and, and tighter relationships. So you really have to figure out what software fits what your business does. I can tell you, LeadDoc, it doesn't work for everybody, right? It's, it's, it's designed for a certain type of a firm. Did you, want to, did you want to add to that, Kelsey? Okay. I do, because I, I, I think dealing with the different systems, the companies can be very difficult. It can be similar to dealing with marketing companies. And I think you have to d ask the direct questions and it, you have to say, does it do this? And they have to give you a yes or no. Don't say, well, it's coming. It's not like, if you're dealing with a company like Five and they're great. They're like, hey, it's, it does this or it doesn't do that. You know, same thing with Lead Doc. You, you've got to get them to say yes or no. And, or it's, it, it's coming in the future is not good enough, okay? You've got to get that commitment, yes or no. Does it do it? And if it doesn't, and if there's a deal breaker, on your list there's probably a deal breaker of things. If it doesn't do it, then you shouldn't hire that company. So don't go for promises of the future. Go for, yeah, does it do it, yes or no, and, and move on if it doesn't. So there's been a bunch of conversation today about intake and conversion. Kelsey, you said intake and conversion is where you should start to automate your business because you've got things coming at you. They need to be organized. You need to capture the information coming in. You need to communicate with the people that are going out. 70% approximately of all intake and conversion is not converted right then and there. It goes into what we call chase. I want to start with you, Eric. Specifically describe to me the automation and how, how automation you, you started this when, when uh, Gary asked you the first question, and I kind of cut you off, and I, I'm not sorry I did that because I had, I had a, I, Gary didn't realize I had a, a series of questions. But what is the automation process? And tell me about this intake and conversion because it's the biggest hole, it's my opinion, it's the biggest hole in everybody's bucket. I can tell you absolutely flat out it's the biggest hole because what you don't know, you don't know, and what I think automation says is what you don't know. We know what we got, we know what's coming at us, we don't know what we're missing. Right. So we actually talked a lot about this this morning um, in all these different sessions about getting leads and doing all this marketing to get these leads. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you just a, I'll tell you a story of something that happened to me in a one hour span. I, I went to the Florida Association of Justice a few months ago and spoke. And when I got to the airport, I had a, I got a rental car um, and as I was checking, getting off the plane, I got a text message from Hertz telling me that my car was ready and here's the spot that it was in. And I got to the hotel and before I got to my room, I got a text from the front desk asking me if my room was okay and if I had any problems to respond back. And my wife had groomed, uh, booked an appointment for the dog to be groomed the next day and I got a reminder text message. This all happened within like a 60 minute span of time. And so think about the $60 car rental, the $150 hotel room, and the $40 dog grooming all took the time to send me a, a text message or an email uh, to remind me of what was going on, right? Obviously far lower revenue than as, as any potential uh, injury case, immigration case, whatever it happens to be. But almost every law firm I talk to doesn't have any of these processes in place. They, if they're texting people, they're doing it manually on a cell phone, trying to remember to do it. And so it's, it's really about taking all this time and effort and money that you spent to take the leads that you got and turn them into clients, right? And so one of the key numbers you can, if you remember anything about this, is if you only contact a person one time that comes to you through a website form or web chat or whatever, you have about a 48% chance of converting them to a client. But if you try six times, you're about 93%, right? So anyone that's right now, if you're getting a web chat and you call that person back and they don't answer and you give up and you, you think, well, I'm going to remember tomorrow or write myself a post-it note. The amount of money you're losing because of not having these things in place is tremendous. Okay, I'm talking hundreds of thousands of dollars for a lot of firms because they don't have these, these automations in place. None of this stuff is really that complicated. It's just it's having these touches in place to remind your staff 
to do what you know is the right thing. I mean, you, you, anyone in here can tell me what is the best practice. If I have a lead, what are the steps I need to take for the best chance of converting them into a client? You all can probably give me a, a pretty good idea of what that would be, but almost nobody does it, right? Because they don't have That's a system Eric, telling let me, them. Let me, let me interject some, uh, let me complicate your life here for a minute. Most lawyers in this room and most lawyers that I know are gonna say, if I want the case, I'll get it. And, and I get 94% of everything I want. Well, where does the automation figure that out? And what's, how, does that, how does that work? Yeah, I, I think every firm I talk to comes across with that idea. Uh, they get 95% of the cases that they actually pay attention to. <laughs> the problem is they're not paying attention to 60% you know, of the leads that are coming in. And so what I've seen time and time again is when firms implement a, a process, uh, they increase their number of signups significantly, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent. For firms that are doing a terrible job doing intake on sheets of paper and trying to track it in a spreadsheet, I mean, there's a potential of a, a 30 percent increase in the number of signed up cases with the same leads you already have. Um, I would say that, so one thing that's interesting about the intake process and something that I've observed in some of the conversations that I've had since I've been here is that I've heard that I'm a low volume office, I don't have the volume to need all these crazy applications. Uh, I would challenge you in the sense that even a low volume type of situation after the course of a six month time period, you might get 25, 50, 200 leads over that time period. And I don't know about you guys, but like I have maybe 25 family members that are still alive and I can only stay in touch with like maybe three or four of them without <laughs> using software. So if you're going to have, even in a low volume situation, a tool, and it may not be the same as somebody who's getting 2,000 new cases a month or whatever the you know, crazy numbers are, you're still having to deal with enough interactions with just a small amount of people that having something in place just so that you can reach a conclusion with every lead that you're gonna get. Some of those might, conclusions might be you can't get in touch with them, but reaching a conclusion with every new lead that comes in, in your door or over your phone or through your web chat is a critical thing. It's funny, I, 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 again, I disagree with both of you. So the, and I think that lead, intake and conversion is a very close number two. I think, I think one of the most important parts of a case is getting the case. I think it's really, really important. I think probably the majority of the people in this room, the hardest part is getting that case to the end, you know, getting it past the goal line. I mean. Be honest, by raise of hands, who knows that your caseload is swelling because you're not getting your cases done fast enough? Yeah, I mean, it's more than that, okay? It's, a lot of you are lying, okay? So it's... I think it, if everybody doesn't raise their hand, they're, they're, they don't have cases. It's exactly right. So <laughs> it's... Because I, I think it's more important with the automation element is getting a kick in the ass and having that accountability. That's a big part of these systems is they, it's a kick in the butt where they, they're moving the case forward. And th that's what the small, the small volume... Uh, firms as well, where you have small volume because you're not moving your cases. That's what that's what's that's the problem. I mean, John Fisher, he's he handles gigantic cases, but automation can streamline a lot of that. Getting that case to trial is 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 really hard to do. It's it's voluminous when it comes to the paperwork, when it comes to dealing with notices of depositions, all that. You can automate all that stuff through a variety of systems. And I think that to me, it's that's the most important part of it is getting that case to conclusion so then you can then focus on that, that intake and conversion part. Well, to paraphrase what I'm hearing, what I think I'm hearing, or what I would like to hear, is that it's all important. It's moving everything forward. It's not just moving the intake. Yeah, that's important. If you don't capture it, you don't have anything to move. But it's all about, it's all about excuse me, the process. The process includes, and I believe that what you just said is part of marketing. Because how a, customer, how a client feels, how that case is being taken care of, and how you're communicating about that case is equally important. I mean, percep perception is reality. And if they don't perceive that you are working on something and you don't have things in place, then you're not doing a good job for them. And it's about your reputation. Uh, I want to jump to another. Harlan, can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. I don't want to, and I know you got your thing, but... I had a couple questions from the audience, and you guys have plenty of time. Um, Tyson, on what you said, you, got, you and Jim talk about it. It's the end time marketing. I happen to know all the work you've done to, to 
systematize how you handle the case if you could visit about that. And we have a question about from the audience, because it, it's during the time too, litigation demands, all that, the system you have for medical records, all that. And then we have another question from the audience I was asked to ask, are you, is this a Mac or PC based or does that matter? Take um, those as you wish. Mac sir. or PC doesn't matter. I think both of you will, will I mean, that. I, I'm, I'm a believer of cloud software, so it doesn't matter what kind of machine you're using. Um, so it's interesting. So my practice has changed a lot over the last eight months. I mean, and I'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow, but, you know, my firm split up, and so we changed a lot of stuff. But I can talk about both FileVine and Infusionsoft, the way we do things, and Lead Docket. Um, I've got a, a variety of things. But one of the things that we did with Infusionsoft, and I've changed it a little bit since moving over to FileVine, is automation of medical records. So if any of you all use Infusionsoft, and I know that people call it Confusionsoft, and it's, it took me over 200 hours to build out what I built out. It, it was very time intensive. But we automated the requesting of medical records and bills. And so you request them on day zero, day 10 another letter generates, day 30 another one generates. And those are faxed over and they're sent out right away and it stays on the medical providers. That's one very simple way. I talked about the intake part of it where they get the videos with lead docket. Now they're getting the automated text messaging. Um, those are just a couple of ways that we keep those going. But with FileVine, and I'm, I'm mentioning, I'm, I'm, I know that FileVine's a sponsor, but I'm, I'm giving you specifics. We have something where we have the 30-day case review through FileVine where we set it up where we get a reminder in our report every 30 days that's automated and it tells us, okay, this case, or, or another one is this client has not been contacted in two weeks. You need to follow up with that client. Um, and through a variety of other things, we can then send out automatic text messages. We can send out emails. So these are these are very specific things. But Thanks, through, and I, I want to jump in on that. So, yeah, so, sorry, I'm <laughs> rambling, but these are there's, so, I've got a lot to say. So, so he just said uh, after two weeks, his system's telling him to make a call, and, and we've done the same thing. So the problem previously is we would only contact the client on key phases of the case, right? So if they're treating for many months, we weren't, weren't doing any contact. But then what happens is the clients are calling into the firm constantly wanting case updates. And so the amount of time we wasted having to field these calls and call the people back, it was so much less expensive to set it up so that we were being prompted to make a call every two weeks, regardless of the phase, to check in. And when you do that, you can end up handling a lot more cases with the same number of staff, right? It, this efficiency not only makes the experience better for the client, but it also can make you a lot more profitable. No question. Uh, Ryan Sargent, he's not here. He's a, a listener of the show. We, we've had him on the podcast. He, he actually has been tracking the numbers, and he's noticed a 30% increase, I think is what it is. Uh, Ryan McKean, you maybe tell me if that's different. I think it's 30% increase if he contacts his clients within, or every two weeks on average. So that's, that's a significant difference. Right, and that's $2,000. I mean, I'm sure we could all use 2000 per case more. I mean, that's significant. Interesting, interesting. So we'll get back to the value of the case. <laughs> that's right. That's getting the case. That's getting right. the case. Or getting back to the value, getting what you, what you ask for. So automation is allowing you to, to move your product, to move your business forward. It's allowing you to communicate better with your clients, which is giving them better customer service. You're more efficient when it comes to the processing of the case, less things fall through the cracks. I don't think there's probably anybody in this, in this room that doesn't have a case, some type of case management software. So what are other, what are other uh, forms of automation in the marketing arena? Uh, I'm gonna throw that to you, Kelsey. Uh, from the marketing arena, a lot of, I mean, a lot of folks have been here talking about Infusionsoft and some of the marketing related, you know, email marketing and text, mes text message marketing and it's, I mean, it's becoming unwieldy. It, it, like, uh, there's this chart that I've seen. Like back in 2008, they had a little graph or an image that showed all the marketing automation or marketing technology that existed, and it was like maybe 800 different companies. And now it's like some insane number, like seven or eight thousand over the course of like a 10-year period of time. The number just keeps growing and growing. You got Facebook Messenger bots. You got chat interfaces on your website, you have email marketing tools, marketing automation software, Facebook ads, all this crazy stuff. And um, I mean, it's, it's one of the things that I've, I've seen is a lot of people try to bite off way more than they can chew uh, too quickly. And it's better to get better, really awesome at one thing than it is to be mediocre at none. Uh, you, we have three minutes left. 
Okay, then let me, let me jump to the last question. Uh, there's a strong, very strong perception in some circles that automation takes away from personal touch when dealing with clients. Your closing thoughts on that subject. You know, I talked a little earlier about the experience I had uh, in Florida with getting all those text messages, and I didn't say anything about emails. And so one thing you, everyone should know that people are using Infusionsoft is that your emails have maybe a 20, 25% open rate, but your text messages are about a 98% open rate. People just can't stand to see that, that number bubble on their phone. Um, and so I think because text messages are just simply text, they appear just as, as real as uh, any other communication, where an email obviously can look like it's, it's canned or, or something like that. Um, but you still, in any event, have to blend using the technology to do automation with a human touch, right? You, it, it's not entirely automated. There still has to be a human involvement in this. Uh, one of the things that I've a lot, gotten that question a lot with, with automation removing the human touch from you know, their businesses or it comes off too sterile or whatever that looks like, um, the, the main thing that I want to stress when someone looks at how to automate a system or a process isn't necessarily to remove humans or to remove uh, human interaction. It is to make it so that you don't have to do a bunch of bullshit, like double data entry, triple data entry, moving, like actually copying and pasting information to different tools and stuff like that. Those are the kinds of things that humans just don't need to be doing, ideally. And that uh, if you can remove those types of things, most people would actually like their jobs a lot more if, if you have employees or even your own sanity. I'll just add, I mean, and you all nailed it, but I mean, don't talk like a robot. I mean, that's, I think a lot of this, it's you all design, you think, oh, this is an automatic response. Don't tell them it's an automatic response and delay it by five minutes or 20 minutes. Put something like, hey, John, I just saw that you were on our, our website and I was emailed your information you know, 20 minutes ago or 30 minutes ago, whatever, you can put specifics in there. Um, give me a call when you're free or do you have a time to, to chat? Like, make it personal. I mean, there's, just because it's automated doesn't mean you have to sound like a robot. Think it, that's, a, that's another part of, like, thinking the process through. Just like when you're handling, a lot of you have now thought your cases through from start to finish. Think the intake part of it through from start to finish. What do you want that interaction to be like? Because if you haven't thought it through, it's pointless. It's, it's garbage software if you're gonna do that. Make it personal and that'll solve that problem. Gary, how much time do we have? Uh, you guys got a couple minutes. You wanna do questions from the yeah, audience or yeah, what like do you wanna do? do? What's, what would you like to do? Let's take some questions. Does anybody have a question? Yes. Right here. Rural area, how do you handle the commu electronic communication in a more rural environment? There you go. So my law practice is in Morgantown, West Virginia, and we serve the middle of West Virginia, which is as rural as it gets. 92% of the phone numbers we collect are from a mobile phone. Everyone is texting. So that's a great way to communicate. Everyone doesn't use email, but everyone texts. You know, it's interesting. It goes back to also... Uh, in 1996, uh, my agency had meetings pushing the internet on our clients, you know, we were television based. And, and the big pushback for years was, well, my clients don't have internet. My clients don't have websites. They don't, they don't use computers. That's just bullshit. <laughs> Travis Seriously. has a question. So all this automation stuff on the marketing and those touches is great, but I'm a knucklehead attorney. Is there a place I can go to find this ought to be basic language of your first letter. Thanks for coming in to see us. This ought to be what you send somebody in the next four or five days. I mean, the concept, I get it, but I'm running up against what in the world do I say to these people in that automated follow-up process? One, call, call someone like us, like me or Jim. We can, like, but I think part of it is, so it's interesting. Uh, and part of it's your state and your area specific, because I will tell you this, we treat our Columbia clients a little different than our St. Louis clients because they're different clientele. But I'll also say this, like, like your state's gonna be way different than ours. Like in Missouri, you can't contact an injury victim for 30 days. So, and what some injury attorneys do is after the 30 days, they'll send a police report to the client and they'll say, hey, you know, if you don't have a lawyer, hire us kind of a thing. So 
for us, the first 30 days is very, very important. So we lock in that client. Those number of touches are way higher in the first 30 days than after that. So that's different in our state than probably in your state. That may be a little bit different. That's why we front load a lot of that. That's really, really important. But I don't know any specific place like what letters you should send. I can, t I can give you every single letter I have. I'll, if anybody wants those, email me, although I hate email. Call my office. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you what I have. I'll, I'll give you my entire case map if you want. If, does that answer your question? One, one thing I'd like to add to that is if you just go look in your sent folder in your email and just look at some of the messages that you send four, five, ten times a week or, or more, uh, that gives you a lot of really good spots as to where to start is like content wise. I mean, we're not talking like sophisticated newsletter. We're talking a two sentence email. It's like, hey, here's the link to my calendar. Click on it to book an appointment or that kind of shit. How do I practice, how do I balance practicing, being a lawyer and doing all the process and all the automation stuff? Because I want to be a lawyer, I don't want to have to go be a, be a computer programmer. Hire other, these guys? Other than hire someone. Hi, oh, never mind. You can. Is, is that the answer? Well, that's, 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 an, that's, a, that's an issue when it comes to where we are in the world of marketing and such. You know, can you, you're working in your business or on your business. You know, many, many litigators, heavy litigators, you know, they can't market their practice. They, well, they do, they do, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quandary that you have. You know, the truth of the matter is, is you have a business. Uh, I was one of the founding uh, uh, principles of National Trial Lawyers. Now, when we started that, it was because of the business of law, and if you look up the National Trial Lawyers, it's from the preeminent trial attorneys in the country. Gary, you're a member. It, it, because they recognize that it is a business, and you have to find time or hire someone to do the business end of it. And that's the best answer I can give you. There's no way around it. Thank you. Thank you, Harlan. Thanks to everybody. These folks are all around to ask your, answer your more specific questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.